Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. For those of you who are able to watch the film with us, and for those of you who are just joining us for the panel discussion, by way of introduction for a third time today, I am Kate Mogulescu. I am a co-director of the Center for Criminal Justice here at Brooklyn Law School, together with professors Stacey Kaplow and Jocelyn Simonson. And I'm also the director of the Survivors Justice Project, um, a collective that hopefully you're going to hear a lot more about through the discussion this evening. Um, I am not going to be talking that much tonight um, because we have an amazing panel uh, rich with expertise and perspective in the issue of extreme sentencing, incarceration, and domestic violence. Um, our panel tonight is going to be moderated by Alessandro Nardi, um, who will introduce himself. But for now, I just would like to say that I am grateful to all of you for being with us tonight. Uh, and I'm grateful for all of the attendees and participants. With that, this event is being recorded and I'm gonna turn it over to Alessandro. Thank you uh, so much, Kate. And thank you all panelists and everyone here who's attending. Um, my name, like Kate said, is Alessandro Nardi. I'm a third year student at Brooklyn Law School. Um, and I can't say how grateful I am to be part of this discussion tonight. Um, I know that I have a lot to learn from the panel that we're about to have, and I hope you all out there feel the same way. Um, I was introduced to this community of survivors and activists and advocates through Brooklyn Law School's Criminal Defense and Advocacy Clinic, which I've been a member of for just over a year now. Now, the clinic works with survivors of family-based and intimate partner violence as they seek post-conviction relief in New York State everywhere. Uh, mainly, we focus on resentencing applications under the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, or the DVSJA. And if you had the opportunity to watch the film, you saw video footage from inside the legislative chambers as they passed that bill, um, particularly in the New York State Senate, and that was done by an overwhelming majority. That was done by 53 votes in the affirmative and only eight um, in the negative. Governor Cuomo signed the DVSJA into law in early 2019. The law went into effect in two stages. Uh, sentencing under the DVSJA began in May of 2019 and resentencing began in August of 2019. The DVSJA was the culmination of over 10 years of adv advocacy by a community made up of women incarcerated in New York prisons and advocates and allies outside of those prisons. As you saw in the film, this was a community banding together, generating action to have their humanity highlighted in the criminal legal procedure. In a very technical sense, the DVSJA did two things to the New York state laws. It added the criminal procedure law, section 44047, and it created penal law section 6012. Penal law 6012 lays out sentencing guidelines. CPL 44047 provides the mechanism by which those who have already been sentenced can seek resentencing, and they use penal law 6012's new sentencing structure. But at its core, the act reflects a need to think differently about people who have been subjected to substantial abuse. That's a significant contributing factor to a crime they're being sentenced for or have already been sentenced for. The act recognizes that in these situations, traditional sentencing is unduly harsh, which is why an alternate sentence is not only appropriate, but necessary. And you can find those phrases, substantial abuse, significant contributing factor, and unduly harsh, you can find them directly in the language, word for word, of CPL 44047 and Penal Law 6012. So with all of that background, I am so grateful to be able to introduce our panel for tonight. Um, I'd like to start with Kim Dadu Brown, who you all saw uh, in the film, and we'll work our way around from there.
Hi, I'm Kim Dedu Brown, survivor advocate and um, former coalition member for the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act and a proud member of the amazing crew on the And So I Stayed award-winning award -winning film. And uh, let's go next to Patrice Smith. Um, hi guys, I am Patrice Smith and um, I am a survivor and I was released from prison in September 2020 um, under the DVSJA after having served almost 22 years in prison. Um, I guess I kind of just want to illustrate real quick that having traumatic experiences are like irreversible. There is no cure for the aftermath of rape or the breaking of your spirit after a man repeatedly beats you. Um, what most survivors learn are coping skills and skills to help them when they wake up in the middle of a night due to flashbacks or meditative deep breathing when you become anxious next to a group of men. This law has incredible value for incarcerated survivors and survivors as a whole. However, we need traction in the courts and you know, I'm just hoping that we can illustrate that tonight. So I'm so glad that you guys witnessed the movie and are here with us. Okay. Thank you, Patrice. Um, moving on to Monica. Hi, my name is Monica. I'm part of SJP. I'm on the advisory board. I'm a survivor and advocate. I did 23 years in prison. I was released by clemency by Governor Cuomo in 2020 after receiving a 50 to life sentence. And I hope to talk a little bit more about SJP's work and my own experiences later. Thank you. And Natalie? Hi, I'm so grateful to be in this Zoom room with everybody. My name is um, Natalie Patello. I am the co-director, writer, and producer of And So I Stay. Thank you all. And I cannot say how excited I am to um, get into the discussion. Um, I just want to kind of briefly go over, we talked about, uh, or I talked about, um, that the DVSJ passed in 2019 and people started seeking resentencing uh, in August of 2019. So since that time, over 250 people in prisons across the state, both men and including both men and women, have started the process of seeking resentencing. Um, as of today, 16 people have already been resentenced. That's essentially 31 years that have been saved of people's people being incarcerated. Uh, next week, uh, the Criminal Defense and Advocacy Clinic has been working with someone who's about to be the 17th person uh, resentenced, in, and that'll be in Orange County, New York. Now, if all of these survivors had been sentenced under the DVSJA initially, that would have saved 116 years of unnecessary incarceration. I just want to sit with that for a second. 116 years. So we've been, we at Brooklyn Law School's clinic have been collecting this case data to track how the law has been implemented um, and to see who, who are the survivors that are trying to use this act um, and what we're finding is that it's, it's not just people who have been, uh, you know, involved with intimate partner uh, abusers. It's across the spectrum. And I think we'll get into that a little bit later. But I do kind of want to reference the film for a moment. And just for me, what I saw from this film was three big themes, one of which I saw a, a lot of different communities and one big community. Um, I saw a lot of those communities striving to take action to bring humanity to the forefront of the criminal legal process. So I wanna start with Natalie and just ask, what, what in particular drew you to this community and to this action? Thanks, Alessandra. That's a that's a great question. Um, so this work started back in 
um, or when I started to get into this work, when I started to um, report on the topic uh, was 2015 when I became a grad student at Columbia. Um, I had, uh, I have, I'm a survivor myself and uh, lost my sister in 2010 uh, because she was killed by her abuser. So going into grad school, I knew that I wanted to cover domestic violence uh, or intimate partner violence, family violence, gender-based violence, you know, all across the board, I wanted uh, to make sure that um, that was being covered with the nuance that it deserved. Um, and so um, in talking with one of my advisors about my personal mission, um, I, he, he planted the seed of, you know, how about you cover the issue of survivors who are incarcerated for fighting back or being coerced by their abuser to commit a crime or any series of crimes? And, and I like, because the data is not out there, as you all know well, that like concrete data about how often this is happening isn't out there. I could not um, wrap my mind around that this was happen happening with such great frequency. Um, I could tell anecdotally it was um, because of my reporting and, and then I met Kim and she was, you know, pushing hard for this legislation, which didn't seem to be going anywhere back, you know, six years ago now, um, six is my math, right? <laughs> yeah, a while back ago. And I could not wrap my mind around the fact that we were incarcerating, criminalizing um, survivors for wanting to live. Like, cause I knew the alter there was no other alternative, you know, whether it was they were forced to commit a crime or coerced in some way, or whether it was fighting back. Like, I just could not understand how that was justice. So ever since then, um, been covering the issue. And then, uh, you know, my co-director, Dan, um, he was the one who said, after he read my master's project, would you like to make this into a documentary? And we spoke to Kim and, you know, kept following her journey and then kept following um, the DVSJA uh, and her efforts to get that passed along with, you know, the community effort to get it passed. And um, we wanted to keep the cameras rolling even after it was passed to see how it was being implemented. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a long journey or, you know, so really cool to see that it's being implemented now in, positive ways as well. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing that about yourself and, and also about this film in particular. Um, Kim, I wanna turn to you because your story is featured so prominently in the film. And from what I remember, one, I mean, I watched the film about a week ago, but one of the opening scenes of the film is we see you um, at the Women's March and you are, collecting signatures. You're trying to basically mobilize the people that are directly around you to support uh, this bill, which at the time, you know, I'm not sure that anybody who we were talking to knew what it was really about. Um, but you had already been released. And so I want to ask you, what drew you, what drove you to continue to work on this issue, um, even though the DVSJA wouldn't directly benefit you and, and, and your kind of contact with the criminal legal system. Hi, Alessandro. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wow. Um, I, I don't think I really had a choice. Um, when I was arrested in 1991 and I seen the, the lack of knowledge that the criminal justice system actually had on domestic violence. I knew back then I wanted to do something, but at the age of 24, I, I had no idea. So, um, you know, you do your time and uh, 17 years later, actually it was almost 16 years later, um, I met with some women um, in Albion Correctional Facility who were doing prison monitoring visits and, you know, it's shunned upon by the officers if you talk to the civilians, but I didn't care. And I knew that something had to be done, something had to give. And I knew these women and their plight. And um, they said that they were thinking about drafting some legislation. And would I, you know, give my two cents? And I was like, me? Sure, you know. And, and I said to them, sitting at a table in the rec room, talking to them one day, um, 
I want to do what you do. I want to help. I don't want anyone else to be where I am. I don't want anyone else to lose years of their lives like I have and and for defending themselves. And um, so it just took off. And um, when I came home, just a couple months after I came home, I got permission from parole. I was scared to death. I have to tell you, I got permission from parole to go to Albany for the first um, DVSJA um, rally and, and advocacy day. And um, we marched on Albany and, and we, you know, year after year after year, we, we just, we kept trying and we kept trying and, and all of us collectively wanted the same, the same thing. And that was to prevent any other survivor from being re-victimized and re-traumatized by the criminal justice system for defending themselves. It just seemed ludicrous that we had to fight so hard for something that this seemed so simple. You know, what, why are you doing this to us? And, and why does it not matter? You know, what, what, what we have been through. So I, I just felt like I couldn't help it. And, and I feel like, you know, I can't sleep at night if I don't do this work. It's 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 in me. And just to follow up on that, like where do you remember where you were the day that the DVSJ was was passed, was signed into law? <laughs> it's so funny that you say that. Um, you know, everybody remembers where they were when 9-11 happened or what, you know, you always remember these moments, right? Um the, you know, and, and I, I just say 9-11 because that's, that's like one thing, you know, I was in the rec room in C block, C2 North when 9-11 happened. Like I remember, right. Holding hands with another, with, with one of my peers watching the world trade centers fall. Right. So, um, yes, I remember exactly where I was when the DVSJA passed. Um, I was standing in line in the pharmacy, getting my wife's prescriptions. And I was literally watching the the live Senate vote on my phone. So I'm standing there watching it. And, you know, I, we had hoped so many times to get this passed so many years to get this passed and, and it passed. And I literally started crying and I probably was making some strange noises standing in line at the pharmacy, but other people around me were like, ma'am, are you, are you okay? Or, you know, and they're looking at me funny and I'm like, look, look, you know, like I'm saying this to complete strangers, right? They don't know me. They don't know what's going on. And I'm just like, look, we did it. We did it. We got a bill passed in New York state to help criminalize survivors. We, we did it. And and, and then women around me who had, like I said, no idea of who I was or what the DVSJA is, just hugged me and, and, and cheered with me. And they were like, good for you. And this is wonderful. And, and I, that's where I was standing in line at the pharmacy. Hmm. That's, um, <laughs> it's such an interesting analogy to just remember exactly where you were in these moments in your life. And I want to turn to um, Monica and Patrice, because at this point, you, both of you were still incarcerated when the DVSJA passed. Um, and I wanted to just ask, how, how did you come to find out that the DVSJA had been signed into law? Um, I can, we'll start with Monica, and, and then we'll go to Patrice. It's interesting when you found out inside, I was still in Bedford Hills and, um, you know, you heard a lot of buzz about it over the years and there was always hopefulness, but there was always this, this, you're going to qualify and I'm not sense of, um, of, of how it came to be. And even after it passed there, yes, there was jubilation, but there was that automatic splitting of people believing that the only people that were gonna qualify for this law are people that killed their abusers, not other people who you know, committed crimes under duress or under coercion or, you know, so it was, it was an interesting process to watch happen 
And then there, there was the exclusions to the law, which are problematic and hopefully we'll talk about later, where it excluded certain groups of individuals who by all rights should qualify for the law, but wouldn't. So there was limitations within the law. So yes, there was all this buzz and there was all this, and there, then there was not enough education. So people inside, yes, there was the group that was connected to, to the effort and that was the smaller group. And then there was you know, women in general who were like, what does this mean for me? And people on the inside really lacked education on what did it mean for them and, you know, how did it apply to them? And, you know, so that was my first experience with the DVSJA. And Patrice, did, do you feel like you were one of those people who was inside the know or outside the know at that point? Um, sort of like Monica, I definitely um, feel like it was spoken about around the jail. It gave hope, but I was specifically told by like, um, you know, we have like jail lawyers. Um, they specifically told me that I was not going to apply for this because, you know, everybody had the idea that this was a, a law only meant for the perfect domestic violence case, like the perfect where there was records of abuse, where there were police reports, Um they did not think that I was going to qualify. So it was actually amazing. Um, I didn't really have hope because I believe that this was meant for the, you know, perfect, um, you know, the perfect domestic violence victim too. So it wasn't until I actually got to Albion that um, I was contacted and that they did say that I did qualify for it and um, really understand. And I think my understanding of DBSJA began then because I understood that it, it was a new framework to look at all a lot of crime, you know, a lot of instances or situations, not just this particular um, perfect domestic violence crime. And um, however, because I was the first one to go through it in Albion, you know, I did become like the person that everybody came to, to see if they did apply, you know, and what steps they should take and, you know, how do they reach lawyers? So the law is impact, you know, this law has been impactful at least in that sense. Yeah, yeah so, it sounds, you know, we're, we're talking a little bit about the kind of community, Kim, you, you, you talked about the community kind of outside of prison that would have been both inside and outside that had been working. And Monica and Patrice, you were talking about what's going on inside. And um, something that I found really interesting about the film um, that I wanted to ask Natalie about is you started this film and you were having these very intimate moments on camera with people's families who were potentially going to be impacted by the DVSJ. And I just wanted to ask what your impression was at that time of how the DVSJ was going to impact those family members, that other part of the community. <sighs> I, sorry, that was a heavy sigh. Um, you know, it, yeah, in the film you see like with Tanisha it was resentencing and then with um, Nikki it was uh, at trial that would affect her sentencing after trial. So um, I, I think there was always hope. So it sort of gave back hope where hope had sort of been taken from the criminal legal system. Um, so that definitely was noticeable once, once you know, oh my gosh, there's a, an, a tool, there's like a, a potential way out that, you know, you know, that, that I could, that my loved one could qualify under. Um, and because the law itself is so new and then the pandemic happened, I think in Tanisha's case, you know, it was hard to understand how it would play out um in in the resentencing um and and also you know i'm sure in patrice's case or you know it's it's really hard to uh, it was hard to understand because the legal system which was already um <laughs> under immense stress let's say um you know that sort of you could in the pandemic you could see it being that that being magnified more you know you were able to see the real flaws of the system and so um so that was, uh, you know, it was hopeful, but it was always like, you know, in Tanisha's case, like, does it apply to me? Um, I have hope. I'm just not sure how much I should give into it because I felt like the system has let me down so much. And then in Nikki's case, 
um, as you see in the film, you know, like she, um, she and her family had incredibly high hopes, but I think once they saw the way trial was going, um, and I think Kim can speak to this as well, but once people saw how trial was going, how the prosecution was handling the uh, information, how some misogynistic and, and real, I mean, like horrendous uh, tropes were being sort of, you know, used uh, at trial, I think people started to get nervous about wh whether or not the DVSJA um, sentencing would help. Um, so it, it was with caution, it was hope, but with caution. Um, and so, you know, now it's incredible the, what the appellate court um, did when in overturning and saying, you know, these antiquated beliefs that the county court had, um, you know, were unacceptable. So she was qualified, uh, which sets an incredible precedent and I think was sort of what everyone hoped for. But again, she's still in prison, like she's still has to set, you know, serve three more years. And who does that benefit? I, 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 I'm, you know, and I'm sure her family members and her loved ones are asking the same thing. Glad that she's been validated and that the court system sees her as a survivor of horrendous domestic abuse, but, you know, who benefits from another three years of her sitting in prison is, is, is the question there. Um, I mean, you know, they're needing to be more work done. So can I just piggyback on something Natalie just said and Kim said it earlier too. It's always astounding to me that here we are over two decades later from when Kim was convicted to now and we're still dealing with a lack of education. How ill-informed people are today. And, and I guess that, you know, let me bring it back full circle is why SJP their Survivors Justice Project came to be because, yes, we have this wonderful law that has great potential, and yet you have to follow through with implementation. You have to follow through with, you know, um, education because we, we know how lacking education is. We have to educate people on the law, educate people about some domestic violence, and it feels like we're doing this all over again, 20 years later, every 10 years. And in, in, in the ways that people are criminalized. And it begs the question, why? Why are we always brought back to the same place of where women are either not believed, not understood, you know? And so this is why organizations like SJP come into existence, you know, to, to make sure that, yes, that the, the um, DVSJ is applied, it's successful, and that we, you know, look at trends, you know, you follow trends, you, you know, Alessandro, you talked earlier about looking at trends and looking at the data to see what is lacking and who, who's eligible, who's believed, what, what segments of the population are left out, you know, and Natalie mentioned a little bit earlier too, the, um, in the film, it gives it a very narrow definition, it, you know, and if you're not informed, you'll believe you'll you'll think that the law is just for people who kill their abusers and it's not. It has a much broader definition. And it, yes, it does say in the instant, you know, if it, you were under on the instant offense, I mean, that that language is problematic when you talk about if you're under. How, how do you say it, Alexandra? I forgot the direct <laughs> quote that you said. Sure, it's a uh, substantial abuse at the time. At the time of the yeah. offense, you were subjected to substantial abuse, which was yeah. a significant contributing factor in the instant offense. Yes, and and that doesn't take you know, and people, and and you see in different opinions that come out when people apply, you know, there's a, a different understanding. You know, some courts take that to to mean literally in that moment that you must be under some type of duress in that moment. And then other courts will take it to mean that, you know, and they look at PTSD, longstanding trauma, and they see the cumulative effect that led that person into that situation. And it's like what Patrice said earlier, it's you, the trauma is lived and you, you know, childhood trauma, you live with trauma hood trial throughout your, lo your life. It just doesn't dissipate once you get arrested or once you commit a crime, it's still there. And so that lack of understanding is something that we're, it just baffles me that we are still contending with, with all that, you know, the understanding of PTSD, trauma bonding, 
you know, but yet in cases with women, we're always back to square one. So I, 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 that is really, um, you know, one place my mind had gone was what was the hope? You know, it sounds like there's this hope for getting released, but there's like a broader hope for like the movement um, of the DVSJ. And I think you're touching on kind of this hope for education and educating across the spectrum, both people who are inside, who might be eligible for resentencing, but also people on the outside who might have the impact to put someone um, in prison based on their lived experience. And I just wanted to, the title of the film is, And So I Stayed. And for me, you know, I think that the film shows a lot, it embodies a lot of, it, it brings to light what that means in a human way. And I thought maybe we could start with Kim and go around and just talk about what does that, what does the title of the film mean to you on a, on a human level? Oh, that, that's, that's a fabulous question. Um, Natalie, if I can just jump right to how we got the title of the film. Um, you know, we hemmed and hawed and wondered, you know, do we do this? Do we do that? What are we going to, what are we going to name it? It's got to be, you know, it just had to have the perfect name. And they came up with, and so I stayed. And, and, and so I stayed kind of has two, two facets to it. Um, when you're in an abuse, for myself, when I was in an abusive relationship, it was easier to stay with him and know which way the blows were coming than to start over with someone new because I believed every man hit. I felt like it was just a matter of time in your relationship until he hits you, until the violence comes. And so, and so I stayed because it was easier to know which way the, bla the blows were coming. And, and then after coming home, I know so many people who just don't want anything to do with advocacy, don't want anything to do with remembering where they just were. But for me, I couldn't just walk away from it that easily. I couldn't just say, well, I'm out, you know, I see art out, I'm home, whatever. It, it wasn't that easy. And so I stayed in the fight to end domestic violence because again, I didn't want anyone else to suffer or go through what I had been through and what we have been, what Monica and Patrice and I have been through and so many others. And I just did not want that. And Natalie also, I did not want that to happen to anyone else. And I knew um, I'm just one woman, but I have a voice and I found my voice and now you can't shut me up. And now I, you know, I'm going to, you know, I have two bullhorns in my car and I'm ready to pull up on a corner and hold a rally at any time all by myself. We have to end domestic violence. And so I stayed in the fight to end domestic violence. That's um, a really powerful way to think about it. And I wanted to just pose the question to Patrice and see if there's anything that resonates for you specifically about the title and then Monica and, and then Natalie as well. Um, I actually think that's such an incredible question. So thank you for asking it. And for me, when I think about that actual title, I'm actually thinking about, because a lot of the work that, you know, SJP do is trying to change the narrative of trauma and all of that, is that I believe that that was a perfect title because society are angry at women who stay. You know, they're angry at them. And it, it's reflected in the court system when they, you know, um, when they sentence them. There is no empathy. It's a... It's a fight for, oh, well, you know, the first time he hit you, you should have left. Why did you stay? Like, you're angry. And I think that, you know, the title alone can make people um, maybe ask themselves why they may have stayed in a situation that they didn't like. You know, we've all had those situations. And it's like being forgiven to the person who wasn't strong enough to leave at that moment. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Monica, I don't know if anything, if you want to add anything to that. Well, um, so I, I feel like in my experience and how what resonates with or doesn't resonate with me and so I stayed <laughs> is, you know, in my own personal experience, I was estranged from my husband at the time. So my the crimes that I was convicted of participating with him in, I was initially kidnapped and then 
forced to participate in these crimes and then it ended with me lying on the floor suicidal trying to kill myself. So there's what happened in between. And often what's said, the most dangerous time for abuse victims is when they leave their abusers. It's some of the most dangerous time. So that's like what resonates with me is why people often do stay because it's sometimes more dangerous to leave than to stay. Natalie, I don't know. I mean, it's you and, and your um, and your co-director. I, I want to just want to ask if there's anything that you heard or you witnessed while you were filming that made you think that you needed to use this as the title. Yeah, I mean, I, I love hearing everyone's sort of reaction to the title. Um, and it should be interpreted, uh, interpreted, um, sorry, uh, you know, through a personal lens. And I'll say, you know, taking the filmmaker hat and putting the survivor hat on, um, um, I won't go too much into it. I probably won't go at all into it, but knowing that the abuse doesn't end when you leave um, and it's not your fault because that's how these systems are set up. You know, whether you have children and you're dealing with family court um, once you leave, um, you know, or wh whether there's like a CPS investigation that goes wrong uh, uh, for many reasons where the mother is demonized and criminalized or, you know, in some way, you know, there's always a layer of, um, of criminalizing the survivor, even in, even in family court. So part of the and so I stayed is speaking back to the societal problems in um, even like it's not how I mean, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, you know, so it's like, you um, um, really taking into consideration why people stay, but also really understanding that they stay even, you know, like after they leave, because they're not allowed to really continue with their life because trauma does stay with you. Cause that trauma is not something that goes away or is erased. It's, you know, meditative work as Patrice had said earlier, whatever you can do to build coping skills, but there is a lot of grief involved in be, you know, having been being subjected to any type of abuse or trauma. So, um, so it's just sort of, uh, you know, honoring the parts that um, say, you know, it's, it's really not our fault, but we are sometimes stuck in the, this endless cycle because other people are not aware enough or not educated enough, ju judges, lawyers. And I always, want, I always want to say, you know, like these cases don't just like come up in criminal court one day, like that's it. Like it, there's these are not isolated incidences in which you can't backtrack all of the things that you see, whether there's documentation or not. If anyone cared to talk to the survivor victim, you know, and really take into, take the sort of toll that the abuse had on them, if they were tra trained to see fully, um, you know, that, that I think that would make a huge difference in, in our response, whether it's that person's lawyer, because sometimes the lawyers who are defending, in Kim, you know, in Kim's case, like defending you are the ones telling you, don't take the stand, don't do this, you'll look bad. And they're sort of a cog in the system. I'm sorry, but it's, so it's just, really calling out, um, you know, that it's not the abuser's fault. I mean, sorry, not, sorry. It's not the survivor's fault. It's either the abuser's fault or the system's fault for not acknowledging the abuse that the survivor has endured. And really, again, the abuse, unfortunately, does not end just because you leave. Um, it, it becomes easier to breathe sometimes, but it, it doesn't mean it's over. Um, and we need to do better to make sure people can breathe a lot, a lot easier. And that heaviness is lifted because survivors just, they, they take too much burden. And um, so, and so, yeah. And so I say that's, that's, that's my interpretation of it. Thank you all for, for sharing all of that. And as, as you were all talking, it made me think back to the film and something that Nikki said um, which was leaving doesn't mean living. And that makes me really, this concept that it stays with you for a long time, I, I want to kind of shift to the, to the actual language of the law, if we can, and just talk a little bit about 
how the law is written and, and how it's being implemented by the courts. And so, as I mentioned before, the law requires that uh, either for sentencing or resentencing, it requires that a person provide corroborating evidence that they were of uh, that they suffered substantial abuse at the time of the instant offense, um, and that that abuse was a significant contributing factor to the offense. And one place where in, that in the clinic we've seen and been focusing on is this concept of at the time of the offense. And I wanted to just pose the question, um, if you could talk directly to judges, how would you tell them to think about that language? Because right now they're, the, last, the latest decision says that at the time of the offense means that the uh, abuse had to be ongoing. It has to be ongoing at the time that the offense was committed. So um, I'm going to pose that to, uh, to Kim first, and we'll go around um, just to talk, start that conversation. Wow, that's, that's a power, that's, that's a loaded question right there. Um, how long do we have? I, I would say um, to the judges um, to start there. At the time of the offense, um, every time I went in front of a judge for a um, for an order of protection um, or because I had had him arrested, um, I was a battered woman. I was a victim of domestic violence. You know, back in the 80s, 90s, they called it battered women's syndrome. I I was battered. So I had a syndrome. It wasn't that he couldn't stop hitting me, but I had a syndrome. So at walking into the courtroom, I felt like I, I was already at a deficit and um, I was and, and I was the one pressing charges. So what I would say to the judges, um, it, well, first of all, the wording at the time of the instant offense, um, I have PTSD to this day. Like some of the other ladies said, and anxiety, holy moly. and and. And so, like the other lady said, it, it doesn't stop. You don't stop being a victim of domestic violence because your abuser is no longer there or because you got away from them for a day and you could get to the police and you could get to the hospital. You're still a victim of domestic violence. If you're, if, if you're defending yourself, they automatically see you as the abuser. And, and see how that switches, right? You went from being a victim and now you're an abuser. So there is, once you're a victim, you're a victim. It doesn't stop. It doesn't change. And, and to say that someone has to be physically attacking you is wrong. Because even when he wasn't with me, he still controlled me. I still raced to the store and raced home, had to bring a receipt to show how long I was there and what time I left. Check the mileage on my car to make sure that I didn't drive too far and he wouldn't be mad or question me why I went back to Wegmans twice, to the store twice. Um, so you're, you're still a victim. And, and, and I think that, and I hate to say this, but I think a lot of it is political. I think, you know, after I got hit at the board five times, you know, it didn't take five times for a tree to fall on me to realize the truth. And that was that it's political. It's not personal. I had a violent crime and I got lumped in with all the other violent crimes. And it, it's political. It's purely political. And just to take it a step further, the prisons are the biggest money making monopoly in the United States, right down to the people who fund the commissary. So it's okay for the system to fill up the prisons. And so it's okay, or it's easy for the judges to turn a blind eye to who and what a person really is. And I was a victim before I was a defendant. And they take no notice of that. All they take notice of is the instant offense. And I see now prosecutors. Um, manipulating the words of the law 
to suit their need, to suit their drive. And the defense attorneys are like in Nikki's case, I, I sat at Nikki's um, DVSJA hearings and I was like, wait a minute, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. This isn't the way it's supposed to go. This isn't what we fought 10 years for. They got it all wrong. Like I said to Elizabeth outside, they got it all wrong and they're still getting it wrong. And what it's going to take is for people to stop turning a blind eye, stop thinking it can't happen to them, stop victim blaming. Why, why didn't I leave? Why didn't he stop jumping on me? Why didn't he stop terrorizing my life? So I think that that judges, I think we need more education in the courtroom. We need to we need to educate these judges and and tell them that you are a victim of I if if I had been able to leave my boyfriend and get with someone else, I would have still been a victim of domestic violence here and in my heart and in my soul. It doesn't go away. But in the courtroom, they don't see that. All they see is that someone died, someone has to pay. That's all they care about. They don't care about why. They don't care about any of that. And I think that that sort of revelation needs to be made with lawyers. Let's get the law students, you guys, you know, get on board. Let's let's have a trauma-informed approach when dealing with victims of domestic violence, because even after she may do something under duress, even after she may get out of that relationship, even after she may be forced to defend her life and kill her abuser, defending herself and her children, she's still a victim of domestic violence. That kind of trauma, like like the other lady said, that kind of trauma does not ever go away. You know, I still still to this day, tell my wife, baby, I'm going to go here, 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 and here. I'll be back by 630. If my route changes and I have to go to a different store, I call her and tell her because it's still here. And she reminds me all the time, Kimmy, you're free. You're free now. But in my heart and in my mind, that's still what I'm supposed to do. So I hope that answered your question, you know, but um, absolutely the law, the law needs to be interpreted the way it was intended to be interpreted and not twisted to suit um, a prosecutor's agenda. That was uh, a really powerful answer to that question. And so I I thank you for... um, for really taking it and 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 really telling the judges what you what you want to see, um, I wanted to turn to Patrice because Patrice, you were actually you actually did stand in front of a judge twice, the same judge twice, um, once once when you were sentenced and once when you were resentenced, and I wanted to ask you whether you saw anything different in the approach the second time that you went before that the same judge um well yes so i initially went to my judge um i initially got sentenced at the age of 16 um my judge had given me 25 to life um so it was definitely a a a complete 360 when i got resentenced to 12 years and um three years post supervision um and walked out of prison with time served um i definitely think that she was very more focused on trauma um I think she had to sit a while to really understand the effects of trauma because my case was my case was just so filled with a, you know about sexual abuse and um I don't know I just think that her being educated and I think that her just realizing that 20 years later the idea of trauma has changed the idea of perpetrator and victim has changed um yeah I, I just think that was 
obviously the reason why she was able to list, you know, hear my application and, you know, release me maybe with the whole heart, you know, and for me, it was an incredible experience because, you know, at 16, I wasn't heard. Um, no matter that I shouted it from the rooftops, nobody cared. They, they see me as the super predator from the nineties and, you know, obviously almost 22 years two years later to get that kind of vindication that kind of like you know what I believe you and I got everything but an apology you know to say maybe you know I should have believed you then um so that was extensive and I also just want to shout out you know like I quickly just say what I would encourage judges to do because I think that my judge was a little bit different in the sense that um she was able to jump out the window and make that decision to say, you know what, even when she had um, conflict with the district attorney, the district attorney was not agreeing with my release. He was not agreeing with the, um, you know, he didn't, they didn't directly disagree that um, I was sexually abused, but he disagreed with that I should be released, you know, from prison. And I definitely commend her for taking that chance when there was no real precedent set at that moment. However, but to all other judges, it's kind of like they need not be scared to take that chance, even when the district attorney is against them, even if maybe the community is against them. They have to also take it upon themselves to do what is just just and right. And to also understand that this law isn't meant to retry somebody. This law isn't to say, now you have to prove to me all over again um, that you were abused or re-traumatizing the victim. This law is meant for you to just look at this crime under a new lens and under the lens of the victim, under the lens of domestic violence. And to keep that like at the forefront and you know, sort of like what Kim just said, it's not supposed to be political. This is not a political realm about you being elected or eventually getting elected. This is about real hum human beings, real people who have been affected, who have seen the worst in humanity and have endured the worst of humanity and really just acknowledging that and you know, putting that you know, in the forefront of them. Yes, uh, I hope that answered it. <laughs> I think it definitely answered it. and. Um, I, I actually wanted to turn to Monica now because I think it's interesting. We're talking about the DBSJA and it's a very specific law and it applies to very spe a specific group of people and it excludes very specifically right at the top of the, of the law. It says this law doesn't apply for these, you know, for these types of crimes and it lists off the penal law codes. And Monica, I mean, I want to just turn to you because you'd mentioned that you weren't eligible to be resentenced under the DVSJA. And I kind of wanted to just pose the question to you. How do we, how would you see the core values of this law being implemented more broadly to, so that people like you might be able to um, fall within something similar to it? Um, the exclusions. So, you know, th there's many exclusions and people don't understand that the breadth of the exclusions that are included. So, you know, there's very few people that understand for, per se that when you're, char um, you're supposed to register as a sex offender, registry does not mean you were convicted of a sex offense. Registry can mean that you were convicted of an array of offenses say per se kidnapping or um sometimes it could be terrorism there's a there's an array of reasons why people might end up on a registry but the law says if you are convicted of a registered a registerable offense you you are not eligible for this or say first degree murder if you were convicted of first degree murder and there's a lot of women you know who are convicted of being of being the ones that conspired to have their husbands killed. Maybe they didn't actually do it, but they conspired and therefore they got charged with first degree murder. And, you know, so there's many instances that exclude people from this law, but yet it's not taken into the consideration, you know, the, you know, I don't think there should be any exclusions. Everyone should be dealt with on, on the basis of, you know, the individual and what happens. And lucky for me at the time when the law was passed, I already had the application in. And so I got clemency shortly thereafter the law was passed. But I, I would have definitely been one of the ones that was excluded from this law. So 
there's I'm looking through some of the questions that people have posed um, to us and we've been talking I think a lot about exclusion who gets to be part of this law who doesn't um, the per this person asks um, that in the film there are a few references to quote fix the criminal system and this person asks um, whether you have thoughts on whether that's even possible whether this system can actually be fixed uh, with respect to survivors and gender-based violence. Um, so I want to start, I guess, with Patrice, and we'll go uh, Patrice, Monica, Kim, and Natalie, too. Um, yes, I absolutely think that we can change this. I think it's all about controlling or maybe expanding our idea, like our narrative about trauma and really understanding trauma and understanding trauma from trauma impacted people, not just merely looking at the theories of trauma and speaking to the experts who may have masters or you know PhDs and postdoctoral degrees and trauma, but actually speaking to the individuals who have been affected by trauma. And I think like having those conversations every day, you know, lawyers having, you know, those extensive conversations every day, judges, district attorneys, like really having those conversations. I do think that we can I certainly think we can make an incredible change in the court system. I don't think that it is just, it's no hope for them. It's just starting these conversations and keeping them going and, you know, hopefully having those conversations with the right people. So I would say, yes, I, I do believe there's hope for the system changing. And I think it just really goes back to education. Like we need to, you know, the the prosecutors, the judges, the defense attorney, they're the proverbial gatekeepers. And education starts with them. You know, often victims who come into their courts don't understand the context of their lives. It takes many years to unravel that. And they are the ones that should be informed. We shouldn't have to be informing them at that time. We're incapable at that time of arrest to inform them of the context of our lives and what happened and to lay out that narrative for them. You know, that narrative work takes many years to, to accomplish and to, you know, to own and to understand. And these, you know, the proverbial gatekeepers of our justice system, they should be versed in this. They should be versed in trauma-informed care and, law, you know, abuse is generational, you know. So, but I do think there's hope. All right, I, I can I can jump right in with that. You guys, you guys are on point. You are spot on. It's education, education, education. And it's 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 gotta be an awakening type of education. You know, people have to, like you said, um, Monica and Patrice, jump out, of, they have to be forced out of their comfort zones to look at these things and and not just look at them to absorb them and know them and and to know that. Every victim is a victim. Believe victims. When did we stop believing our victims? When did we stop believing women? When, when did we stop? And I, I think we never started. I think women have not been believed through the centuries. And I believe that our word isn't as credible and it needs to be taken credibly. It, it, we need to be heard. And that's why I think that this film is so important because it, 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 it says that it validates that, that, that there's a necessity. I think it speaks volumes that uh, Nikki's judge did not believe her. He did not care to believe her and he slept well that night. And none of us did. He slept well the day he sentenced her, he went back to the good old boys club and they patted him on the back and said, add a boy for what? For, for Nikki to do more time senselessly, she shouldn't have done a day. And, and now it took the appellate court. Thank God the appellate court sided with our provision of the DVSJA and that it should have been implemented. And, and that is the only reason. So it seems like, I mean, I have hope because here we are at the appellate court. The police didn't believe her. The judge didn't believe her. But the appellate court got it. They got it. They got it almost right. I'm not going to say they got it right because Nikki would be home right now if they got it right. Nikki would be home right now if Judge McLaughlin had gotten it right. But 
but the appellate court is getting it. So we need to we need to get everybody else on board. And unfortunately, it is the conservatism in the system. It it is, and and it needs to be stopped. It I don't care what side of the party line you are on. This is a universal issue and it spans back to the beginning of time and it needs to stop. And I do believe that people need to come out of their shells. They need to come from under their rocks. They need to buck up and do what's right. So I do believe that through education, like I said, we got the the appellate court siding with us. So everybody, come on, jump on board. You know, you're going to miss the, the the train. You know, we, we have to get this going. And I think that public awareness um, just don't stop. You know, I mean, I, I say it like this. Everybody knows if you've seen the Nike sign, everybody knows what the Nike sign is. What is the sign for ending domestic violence that we can get everybody to recognize immediately? We have to get behind people's front doors. We need to get into people's homes, into people's kitchens, into people's bedrooms with this sort of thing. And I don't care if you're a victim. I don't care if you work for the criminal justice system. It's all about awareness. It's all about awareness and doing what is simply right. Stop victim blaming and and start holding people accountable. Even if that person is deceased, they should still be held accountable in words for what had been done. So I just think that through education and and just not stopping, not stopping, eventually, eventually we'll get through to them. How did we get through to the appellate division? We did it. And, and if we could do it there, I think we could do it anywhere. So just going around, it's, it sounds like people do believe that there is a, a, the potential for the system to, to get it right, whether that means fixing the system we have or um, kind of rebuilding from the ground up. And Natalie, I wanted to just ask you as, as, you know, as an artist, as someone who's able, who was able to put together this film and kind of deliver this message in this, you know, hour and a half way, um, where, where do you see, you know, the future of art or the future of filmmaking in this, um, fixing this system? Do you see it having a place? Thank you for, for framing um, it that way. I, um, there was a reason why we didn't make this a true crime. Uh, we see a lot of true crimes where it shows both sides and it's become, uh, you know, binge worthy sort of entertainment. And that's not what we wanted this film to be. And, um, you know, what true crime does, like when you hear, or like, oh, you're like, you know, you're intrigued by like the idea of following this case um, or the case that, you know, whatever the true crime that will unfold. And, and that's just not what we were gonna do. Um, we weren't gonna follow that mold because it, again, sort of caters to the false narratives that the legal system spins because you're using the same narratives that the prosecutor said you interview the prosecutor see what they say which is the same thing they said in trial so we weren't going to put these women on trial you know in the film oh that light, light is bright I don't know if that but and sorry something came through the window um so my hope is that people really think critically about this idea of of truth you know like is you know, like, oh, I saw the court transcripts, it said this. To dig a little bit deeper in your, your reporting or your documentary filmmaking or whatever it is, um, that, you know, maybe that element of what the prosecutor said, just because it's in a court transcript, doesn't mean it's true. Just because the police report said, um, or didn't go into really, really great detail what the survivor was subjected to, you know, it doesn't mean that you should gloss over um, really horrendous things that, I mean, you shouldn't definitely don't, you know, don't sensationalize trauma, but, um, you know, be, be honest about what it is that we, we, we say domestic violence, we say abuse, we say these words, and sometimes they don't mean anything to people. So part of our hope was to sort of like people had to bear witness to, um, you know, what 
these survivors had been subjected to by their abusers, by the criminal legal system, by society. So I hope, um, you know, I hope journalists, artists, filmmakers, I hope we dig deeper in this idea of truth um, beyond what you what you are taught in journalism school, you know, like, oh, look at the court transcripts, make sure it corroborates with the police report and, and like all these elements where it's like, you're just replaying some of the false narratives that are spun out. So um, we, we did do our due diligence and reported uh, and, you know, took the principles of journalism into this work there. Yes, we did interview prosecutors. Some of them were, you, you actually didn't see any of them, right? Um, there was a reason for that um, um, because, you know, we wanted to give space to not only what, what had happened to these survivors, but to also show those communities that supported them so greatly, show their um, hopes and dreams that sometimes true crime doesn't allow, you know, because it's so much of the mystery of what happened and why would someone do that or why would they, you know, so um, my hope is that we think in a more nuanced way, because I, I do think that like communities and, and audiences, I guess if we want to speak that way, audiences are really uh, they want that material. They want, they like, they're ready for, I think, like a nuanced um, approach. I think, you know, we, we sort of, and, 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 you know, you see it in, I hate it. I hate it so much. Like the shows like snapped, you know, like, like woman who kills. And it's like these horrible narratives that keep getting perpetuated. And, and so, you know, that's just not what we wanted to do. And I, and I hope that came across and, um, and I hope that, uh, you know, filmmakers covering any, any, any type of um, aspect of the criminal legal system really consider um, digging a little bit deeper than beyond the, the transcripts or beyond what a lawyer or a prosecutor or a judge said on the record. Because if you start looking around, like when we interviewed, for instance, Jasir, who um, is Tanisha's son, he, uh, he said, no one really asked me this stuff before. And we didn't really even ask him, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to prompt something that he didn't feel comfortable talking about, but he said, I saw, you know, you heard what he said on the film. That was actually something we didn't ask, that he just felt safe enough to share that no one had bothered even, you know, maybe he was seven and young at the time. So I, I do take those things into consideration, but you know, you can, you can identify how a child is being affected through exposure of domestic violence. You don't have to ask really hard questions. You don't have to re-traumatize them or, or victim, victimize them again. But yeah, there are ways um, in which we can um, take into consideration the other aspects um, outside of what just a survivor is able to say in her most traumatized state. So that's what we wanted to do was explore those threads that um, the criminal legal system didn't or don't usually do and that tr true crime doesn't allow for. And so, yeah. Thank you. I, I think something that stuck out for me from what you just said was this idea of nuance and having this conversation and, and having an understanding in a more nuanced way. Um, and I, just building off of a question that I'm seeing in, um, in the, from the, from the uh, audience, um, someone asks, you know, what's being done to help more survivors be able to use the DVSJA? Because it seems like a lot of people are still being denied. And I'm curious, I guess, just building off of that, do you all believe that if there are more people who are able to access things like the DVSJA or the DVSJA itself, do you believe that judges will be forced to take a more nuanced approach to this? And I, Monica, I know you mentioned um, the Survivors Justice Project and the support being offered there, Patrice, you you as well. I wanted to start with Monica, move to Patrice. How do you, do you feel like that's possible? So to just answer the question, you know, like um, what is being done to help more survivors use the GVSJ in the case? I think that's where SJP come, kind of comes into play where, you know, we help lawyers and other advocates be informed about the DVSJ and, and cases and, and successful cases like Patrice's cases and tracking that, that helps other lawyers potentially use it, you know, when they're applying. So, you know, sharing information basically and educating others about what's, what's successful and, and what works when applying for the DVSJA. 
and cultivating that community. So that's what a lot of this work is about at this point. So, you know, upstate region versus downstate region, a, a lot of, you know, very little resources. So then reaching out to them regions and supporting defense attorneys in the work when they have applications and helping them navigate them cases so that they can be successful. You know, yeah, you know, there, you know, this, this question, a lot of people are still being denied. Yes, because there needs to be a lot more education done, you know, and that's just the bottom line, educate, we're going to always come back to we need to educate people. And, and there's many different people that need to be educated on DBSJA. Patrice, I mean, you, you also mentioned, I mean, in your case, like you went before the same judge twice, like, do you feel, and you mentioned that the judge probably did have a different understanding that second time. Do you feel like that's something that can happen in many cases? Or do you think that the judge that you had was special or particular? Um, I absolutely think it can happen in everyone else's case. I don't think that my judge was any any different than any other judge that has sat on, um, I mean, I'm, clearly she's been on the board for over 20 years or sitting on the bench for over 20 years. So she's definitely no different than any other judge who is sitting out there. I just think that what she did show was courage, courage to maybe be different than what the district attorney wanted her to be, maybe be a little different than um, what society may have expected from her. And so, but I don't think that that means that judges lack the courage. Maybe they just don't know how to apply it in this type of instance, um, but they need to learn, essentially. They just need to learn. There are women that are still incarcerated, um, that are still doing time. I mean, I did almost 22 years, you know? that That's that's just, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Like my whole life was wasted in there. I grew up inside of a prison um, and I'm, but I'm so thankful to be home. So I'm so thankful for the domestic violence, you know, survivors justice act. Cause other than that, I would still have five, almost five more years including a parole hit, because we're going to include the parole hit that I would have had to serve, you know, before I became free. So, yeah, I, I just think just people just need to talk about this law. They need to, you know, they just need to get into their their legislative bodies. They need to get into the district attorney's office. If it's lawyers, they need to talk amongst themselves. They need to reach out to SJP, reach out to Kate, reach out to the Brooklyn Law Clinic if you need help. Um, if you need more resources, reach out to the SJP. I definitely think that SJP is definitely trying to um, help, you know, just inform people, like Monica say, educate in them. SJP is here to educate you and to, you know, just help you at any stage of the process. So. And we're, co we're coming up close to the end and um, of, the, of the discussion. I, one thing I wanted to just raise, you know, at the end of the film, um, Kim, we, we see you going to Bedford and going to kind of welcome Tanisha uh, with her family and, and I'm sure other friends. Um, and I wanted to just ask, you know, what sort of support do people need once they're released, you know, after they've successfully applied for the DVSJ or they've gotten clemency or, and I want to pose this to everybody, like what sort of support is out there for people um, when they've been incarcerated for, for so long and they finally make it out. Well, um, that, that's another boy, Alessandro, you have all the loaded questions, don't you? Um, the, um, when I came home, they didn't know what to do with me. I guess they didn't have a lot of women in Rochester, New York, coming home after killing their abuser and doing 17 years, you know, they, they just didn't know what to do with me. And they seen me as the abuser. And so when I went to go see my parole officer, the day I got out of prison, um, she said that they had to put me in a group for abusers. And the only group they had was a group of abusive men. And I said, you want to put me in a room full of abusive men? And she was like, well, you're, you, you killed him. You're, you are seen as the abuser. Like she basically said, it doesn't matter anything else. And I said, well, you know, I was a victim of domestic violence, right? I said, you cannot possibly, I said, you may as well send me back to prison. I cannot do this program. I can't sit in a room full of abusers. Why would you do that to me? And my parole officer said, well, to be honest, I haven't even opened your folder. She said, go sit out in the other room. And about a half hour later, she called me back in 
and my heart is pounding because, you know, I just got out of prison a couple hours before. And um, she said, oh, you were a victim of domestic violence. Like, oh, like it was, you know, it just dawned on her. And um, she she put me in one on one counseling with a man. And I was like, I can't have a female counselor. I mean, I'm not being sexist or anything, but I still seen all men as a possible abuser, right? I feel that every man has the potential to hit. And um, and and but I have to I have to say in his defense, he turned out to be a really great guy. I was forced by parole to to have um six months worth of sessions with him, which was at first once a week then twice a month and then once a month. And, um, but it was hard. It, you know, they, I, I just didn't understand how you could see me as the abuser. Like, I, I mean, it just, it just didn't register in my mind how, how they could do that. And um, so I think the education needs to span even into every single parole officer on a, a memo on every single parole officer's desk read the file before you call the next person in, you know? And um, I, I think that in addition to that, you know, just coming home and trying to reintegrate, just, you know, I, I can't tell you how much money I lost because I wasn't used to carrying money, having anxiety attacks, going in 7-Eleven to get a stupid big gulp, you know, anything, anything, you know, they, they just, they still get it wrong right down to, the people, you know, who come and knock on your door and do home checks, you know, the, the division of parole, it doesn't even have to be your parole officer. Let me tell you real quick. One time my parole officer came in my house and, um, my wife's nephew, our nephew had, a, a fake plastic gun on the couch. And my parole officer came in and she's looking around and I'm like, what are you looking around for? She's like, I'm looking for your Wii game. I said, I don't have a Wii game. And she said, well, what's that gun for on your couch? I said, oh, that's an old broken BB gun that our nephew plays with. And she said, you know, if I was any other parole officer, I would have to take you in right now. And I'm like, it's a broken BB gun that a child plays with. It's, it's not real. It doesn't work. And she said, it doesn't matter. So, I mean, that still shows. And I had been home over a year at that time. So it still shows the, the lack of education, the lack of understanding, and the lack of a trauma-informed approach when dealing with, with, with someone who was formerly incarcerated, you know, for killing their abuser. The, the stigma stays with you when you go to parole, when you go for a job interview, when you go for housing, when you go for any of those things, the stigma stays with you. And what we need to do, like everyone is just saying, educate, inform, enlighten. That's what we need to do. Does anybody want to add to, to that about, you know, things that um, that people who are being released might need or um, support where they can find support if they need it? Well, I'll just add post-release supervision is not it. <laughs> I've had a very similar situ circumstance. You know, Kim was released a long time ago. I was released to the same community as she was. And um, now they have something that they call like a um, red alert that they place on your file for victims, for people that commit crimes against that are abusers, essentially. So there's a red alert that's posted and it comes with all these stipulations. And I, I had a parole officer that wanted me to report to her who I was dating and wanted to know very specifics about who, when I dated, who I was dating, they wanted, and, and essentially what she told me is you make bad choices. So I want to know. So she's seen herself as, you know, protecting me. But for me, it was you're labeling me a person who commits these types of crimes. You're labeling me the very thing I was being victimized by, by putting this red alert on me, because now it comes with all these other stipulations. And she didn't get the, the effect the label had on me. The Just the mere label of being a person that is abusive to others when I myself had been abused was devastating, you know, and there was many layers to it. You know, I'm, I've been home almost two years come January and I'm on my sixth PO. 
there's no continuity. And what I've needed the most is continuity and stability. And I've had none. And, and I, I recognize I came home during COVID. There's many different challenges, you know, but at the same time being, you know, pushed around from parole officer to parole officer and not having regular contact with any one person, it feeds into my own anxiety. You know, I have PTSD myself and I'm always hypervigilant and not knowing who to contact or who's going to respond what way and having to talk to a new PO constantly and to basically re-educate them. You, you know, a new PO gets your case file. They don't look at your case file. They don't know who you are. You've just been assigned to me. Now I got to go back through it all over again and get reacquainted with them. And, you know, just it's, it's not, you know, people think that supervision is there to assist you. And, and what it is, is just supervision. <laughs> They're supervising you and it's, but other than that, in terms of assistance, I see nothing. I, the only, I feel like it's been more of a hindrance. It's caused more anxiety. You know, when I first came home to it, I had an eight to eight curfew and, and it left me isolated. Having to be home at eight o'clock at night while the rest of my family on a weekday or even a weekend would go out and I'd be isolated at home. I couldn't even engage with my family. I'd have to say I can't go because I have to be home by eight. So, it, you know, it wasn't that I was out there doing anything I wasn't supposed to be doing. I wanted to go get ice cream with my family down the street on a summer night, and I couldn't. You know what I mean? So and it had a negative impact on me for the first year of being extremely alone and isolated. Patrice, I don't know if you want to add anything um, to that. Um, I guess I'm going to kind of say that there are resources out here. I mean, I was absolutely um, it, grateful to have joined SJP, um, SJP with incredible women on the board. Um, I definitely, you know, even one of our members is also Sharon White, who also has her own organization, the WCJA. So there's absolutely um, support out here for um, survivors. And um, I, I was just grateful to actually walk into a a group of women where you didn't just only get their sympathy or their empathy for your, um, you know, for your story, but you also got their anger and, you know, knowing that they're willing to fight for you. And um, also you get that, you walk, you know, just being grateful to have SJP. So, and just stay in that there is support out there. There are organizations and, um, you know, but the first law is we need to get these women home. Okay. None of our cases are, none of our cases are, um, we're not like the exception to the rule, okay? We are the rule to the self. Every case that was in the film, that is the rule, okay? That is, you know, me and Monica's case, we are the rule, okay? They're, these aren't, we're not just highlighted, you know, highlighted um, cases. So yes, so can we get the women home? <laughs> and then we can talk about helping them. Okay, thank you, sorry. I, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, this whole time, we're about to close out, but I think, this whole time we've been talking a lot about, you know, what's the, what's happened up to this point and, and how we got here and how we've gotten all these women and men home um, under the DVSJA. And I guess before we all leave, I think, you know, we saw the action that's been taken up to this point. And I wanna just pose the question to the panelists. We talked a little bit about what judges can do, but what actions can, um, can prosecutors do? What actions can defenders do? law students included, uh, I think we talked about advocates and, and artists, but just in closing, you know, quick things that um, people can do, I guess, um, Monica, if you want to start with, with uh, whoever you decide to pick. I'll pick prosecutors. So um, support more GVSJA applications. The victims and per perpetrators are not two mutually exclusive groups. They are one and the same. Patrice. Patrice. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, definitely, I am screaming out to judges, okay? Please think about the ways in which generational trauma is per perpetuated when survivors are sentenced to prison and criminalized. It is, you know, it's an endless cycle that neg negatively impacts communities at large. Um, we are disrupting communities and judges, you have the, the ability to stop it or at least you know, mitigate some of the harm that's being inflicted, so.
Kim. Thank you. I, I want to shout out to the lawyers. Let's let's get on board. You know, survivors need support beyond what your expertise may entail. Reach out to the larger community to make sure the survivors you're working with have the support they need throughout the process. A trauma-informed approach. We're human beings. We're people just like you, just like you. Believe in your clients and, and make them a part of the process. Keep them a informed at all times. I can't tell you how many times they had um, discussions at the bench that I had nothing to do with. You know, I think my wife says it in the film. Uh, they, they have no, no, no regard for the person sitting at, uh, at, at the defense table. And so I think that lawyers need to, to, to have more of a, a, a human approach. It's a job to you. It's our life. We're fighting for our lives again. And I just plead with the lawyers to help us do that fight. Natalie, any, um, any people, you, any actions you would like to see people take? Yeah, I think just, you know, on any level, advocates, whoever you are, allies, um, get involved, support DVSJA applicants and, and think about how your work overlaps with the criminalization and incarceration of survivors. And when in doing that, make sure that you use a, as everyone has said multiple times, trauma-informed and gender-specific lens in your efforts. And, you know, really think, is justice served when we incarcerate or criminalize survivors? Is that, I mean, is it really serving or benefiting anyone? And that's all I have. I want to thank everybody um, on the panel. Thank you all who watched the film. Thank you all who joined us for the panel discussion. If you're a law student and you want to take action, I highly recommend um, joining the Criminal Defense and Advocacy Clinic. I consider it to be the best thing I've done in law school. It's taught me the most about um, the law and how the law can change and how the system can change for the better. Um, so. I big plug for that. Um, reach out to me or to Kate uh, if you're at Book Brooklyn Law School and you're interested in learning more about that. And I'm going to pass it off Thank to Kate. Thank you so much, Alessandro. Everyone join me in thanking Alessandro for moderating this panel. Um, what an amazing discussion. There's so much more to do and to discuss and to figure out. A lot of decarceration needs to happen and is flowing from this work. We're not quite there yet. There's more work to do, but there have been some real steps within this panel has made that clear. I've been hyping Survivors Justice Project in the chat all night. Please learn more about us. Um, support our work, donate to our work. There's a way to do that now on the website so we can continue to do exactly what Patrice and Monica have been describing all night about SJP. And then of course the broader movement of so many that are here with us that have been working um, on the same goals. Um, but thank you, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful night and be safe. And we will talk to you all soon. Bye.